literally the entire Trump campaign is premised on a lie. Of course I, it the, is. I, the, We're not yeah, but, I, the whole the whole thing just by saying any word in support of Donald Trump. I, is, but who's but but, but, but I, I'm doing that. But I'm criticizing Donald Trump. We, we're we're pretty critical well, of Donald Trump. People, at the, the people that I'm talking about, you're you're right now focusing on the people that are spinning for Joe Biden. But like the people that are spinning for Joe Biden are, are doing so on the margins compared to the type of spin that you see in support of Donald Trump. I and mean, just the, it's like totally, you don't believe your lying eyes kind of shit. Like we're in the upside down world. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. I'm delighted to be here today with like my fourth or fifth favorite employee at The Dispatch, editor and CEO, Steve Hayes. Hey, brother. Thanks for coming. Hey, man. How are you? Can you list the top uh, the top four or five for me? Well, obviously, Ala and Declan, and then we're going to keep the rankings after that a little bit personal. I mean, I okay. guess, I guess you know, my boy Declan has got to be number one. Yeah, not bad. Rachel, maybe. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. Um <laughs> We had a great exchange on your podcast when I was doing my book tour. Uh, was it a tour? You know, my book podcast tour, whatever you want to call that. And uh, we got a lot of good feedback. And uh, I've been wanting to do a redux. And uh, you did an editorial that gave us an opportunity for that last week. Yeah, and so yeah. I appreciate this. I think it's good. I, you know, it's so weird. We, we're like a wash in political opinion. And yet everyone is, is shrinking into micro bubbles. Where for all of this political opinion, we have like very little good faith engagement and dialogue. Yeah. So um, I'm grateful you're doing this. No, I'm with you. And I appreciate you. You came. I did a I, I taught a seminar at the University of Chicago and uh, you came and graced us with your presence there. And we're one of the favorites of the students. Um, they loved Delighted our exchange student. and they loved your, um, should we say, unconventional and informal analysis of the state of play. I think you were a little free. You you t talk in a language that they understood, uh, which was great. Well, that's nice. I have no hopes to be the White House press secretary anymore, and so <laughs> I can just cuss. You know, I think that's basically the short term for it. Um, anyway, I wanted before we got into you know big think stuff about classical liberalism and the state of our democracy. Uh, we had an election last night in Ohio. Um, another L for the normies. Bernie Moreno sweeps every county. He beat Matt Dolan by about 12 points. Um, Moreno had previously in 2016 said there was no scenario in which I would support Trump, uh, mm -hmm. that Trump played to people's worst emotions. Trump is the nominee. I think the Republican Party is a different party and not a party that I want to be a part of. That was Moreno in 2016. Um, but he did the full MAGA pivot like so many of our other pals and ends up winning pretty, pretty handily last night, despite maybe there were some hopes, I think, on the Dolan side that this might have been a rare win for the whatever you want to call it, the more establishment side of the GOP. How do you, how do you assess what we saw in Ohio? Yeah, I mean, it was it was interesting. I don't think anybody would say that Dolan ran as an anti-Trumper necessarily. He That's he true. was he he sort of downplayed his differences with Trump, even though I think he was pretty clearly the most Trump skeptical person in the race. Um, no, I think it's notable that all three of those candidates were at one point. Pretty strong never Trumpers, pretty outspoken never Trumpers. Um, two of them, Moreno and Frank LaRose, the former Ohio Secretary of State, basically just flipped. And in some cases, I mean, I, I, I started following Frank LaRose on social media, I don't know, four or five years ago, in part because he was saying things that were pretty skeptical of Trump at a time when fewer and fewer He was people one of the were. good Secretary of States. He, wasn't, he didn't he go was. like full Raffensperger, but he was like in that mold-ish. Yeah. He was. He was. And he wasn't afraid, sort of unapologetic about the way that they ran the election. He, was, he wasn't He was afraid to sort of speak out about it. And then to watch him periodically when, it, you know, when his tweets came across my my feed, sort of accommodate himself to, to Trump and Trumpism was, you know, we've seen this story how many times? Hundreds, thousands of times. Uh, but it was interesting to watch it in, in this case. And, you know, this is somebody who ended up you know, really selling out for, for Trump and Trumpism. And I don't know what he, he ended up with, like 12% or something. Didn't work out for him. Um, but I think it's, you know, if it, the, the macro point is these are three people who were once uh, openly and outspokenly opposed to Trump. And two of the three of them became Trumpy. And yeah. one of the three of them, I think, campaigned in, a, in an honorable and responsible way, but certainly wasn't advertising that he was skeptical of Trump. Sure. Yeah. I mean, an interesting kind of parallel that was last night. I don't know if you saw this one, but there's this Illinois, I think it's the 12th, where you had Mike Bost, who is, again, not 
not an anti Trump, you know, he's not like out there like Adam Kinzinger, but you know, he's more in the, you know, uh, traditional Republican vein. And he is primaried by Darren Bailey, who runs as basically a Gates, maybe G- Gates plus <laughs> a Gates, Marjorie Taylor Green combo yeah. type Republican. And Bost holds out barely, but has the Trump endorsement, right? You know, this is one of those things where, you know, it's uh, Bailey still almost wins that primary and, and the more normal candidate only wins thanks to an assist from Donald Trump. And it just kind of feels like that's the same story over and over again. I mean, like there's the Brian Kemp exception in Georgia and like, that's like basically it. I'm sure we can come up with two or three other exceptions. Right. And the, I mean, the, the, the Trump endorsement is hugely meaningful in Republican primaries. Um, it's not determinative necessarily, but it's, it's hugely influential. And, you know, one of two things generally happens after Trump candidates win in those primaries, they go on and serve in office and become, I think are more beholden to Trump than they otherwise would have been, which I think is the point of the endorsement, or they lose, they, they face plant like Dr. Oz, like Herschel Walker, uh, like Kari Lake and others. So it's, it's, I would say coming out of Ohio, this makes this a much more competitive race than it otherwise would be. Um, I think if Matt Dolan wins and runs against Sherrod Brown, there's a reasonable chance Matt Dolan is the next Republican senator from Ohio. Um, I think Bernie Moreno is going to be a much tougher sell. Uh, he's going to have to, even in a state that that has been sort of decisively red in recent presidential elections. Um, you know, when J.D. Vance won the Republican primary in a relatively crowded field last time, which included for a short time Bernie Moreno, um, Mitch McConnell's uh, outside groups had to come in with something like $40 million to get J.D. Vance uh, over the finish line. Um, that, that's pretty extraordinary in a state that has trended as red as Ohio has. Yeah. Um, one more thing before we, uh, you know, get over the editorial, the, uh, the Ukraine debates going on over on the Hill. Um, I just, uh, I'm thinking that maybe you get more calls than I do these days from Republican uh, congressional people or folks around them. Like, what is your sense on the state of play of that? And uh, just kind of broadly on kind of the Ukraine debate going on on the Hill right now? Yeah, I mean, it's like so many other things um, in this weird political moment. And by moment, I mean, you know, the last eight years where Republicans will say one thing in private and say another thing in public. Um, yeah, sure. And it's it's really sad if you took a I think if you took a, a, show, a blind show of hands in the House Republican conference on Ukraine, it would overwhelmingly more funding and, and significantly more funding would pass overwhelmingly. Um, the fact that people feel the need to, you know, not only I think that the thing that, that bothers me as much as anything is you have people who are not only saying, you know, making this sort of classical non-interventionist case. Hey, you know, this doesn't matter. We, we really need to mind our own business. We should be looking at the border here. All the arguments you sometimes hear have kind of been shoved aside by more conspiratorial arguments about uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, about Ukraine and corruption, about them being on the wrong side. And so much of that has roots in in Donald Trump's efforts to use Ukraine uh, to get reelected, in effect. And it's it's dispiriting to see Republicans who otherwise know better, I think, making some of those arguments, the kind of not just the principal non-interventionist arguments, but the this is the center of a, an anti-Trump conspiracy. We don't care about uh, Vladimir Putin kind of thing. Yeah. So this quasi takes me to uh, the editorial for folks who don't know what I've been referencing. You guys wrote that the American people should demand better um, how the, how the dispatch is thinking about a Trump Biden rematch basically said, you know, both, I'll, I guess I'll let you characterize it, but both of the candidates are not acceptable. You don't like the lesser of two evils premise, but I, before we get to like, because I think we pretty much agree on the Trump of it all. I think it'd be interesting to kind of hash out the Biden part of what you guys yeah. wrote. Um, sure. and, uh, and, and I guess I, I'd like to start though there with the Ukraine, right? I mean, how, like, how would you assess how Biden has handled Ukraine during his presidency? Reluctantly, uh, slowly and in effect, the kind of leading from behind that we were used to seeing from Barack Obama. Really? You're yeah. leading from behind, you would say? Good. Yeah. Explore that more. 
I think we've taken our cues too often and in too many important moments from Europeans. I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with saying to Europeans, hey, this is in your backyard. We really need you to step up. But for the most part, they have stepped up. And you've seen sort of desperate pleas from the Ukrainians and, and from some Europeans for better equipment, for uh, fighter jets, for you know one after another after another of these things. And I would say the Biden administration usually gets to the right place, but just dithers for months and months and months when I think those kinds of things could have been meaningful. I mean, and what I think here isn't that important. It's, you know, people I talk to who know this stuff a lot better than I do. Sure, sure, sure. I think it could have been meaningful. And and credit to him for standing by Ukraine, for, for making the argument. Um, he doesn't make it as often as I would like him to. But I think there have been costs to the way that he's led on Ukraine. Yeah, I guess. And ra- but I mean, the rallying allies element, I guess I wonder if you look at the political scene in America today, maybe the answer is nobody. Um, but like, and who would be best representing what you think is the right thing on Ukraine? Like, I don't know, Jake Auchincloss, like one of the Democratic hawks in the House. I don't like who, like, I guess uh, we're on the Steve Hayes continuum from Trump, the re- main body of the Republican Party, Biden, Democratic hawks. Like, where, where do you fit? On, yeah, on I mean, Ukraine, just in terms especially. of positioning, you know, I think yeah. you've had some Republican senators who've, who have made a, a good case, many Republican senators who've made a good case, um, haven't made it as often as, as I would like again. But, um, you know, John Thune has, has said good things. I think John Cornyn has said good things. Mitch McConnell has has said good things. Um, you know, in the but House, I mean, it's their Mike fault McCall. right now that there's no funding. It's like their fault. It's like Mike McCall's fault that, that Ukraine isn't getting the weapons they need. It's not Joe Biden's fault. It's like well, I wouldn't McCall's necessarily fault, say right? it's Mike McCall's fault. I would say it's more Mike Johnson's fault, right? I mean, I mean, right. But I mean, if Mike McCall got with Hakeem Jeffries and said, hey, we're going to go around this guy, they could have had the funding two months ago, but they yeah. just refused to do that. Yeah, so I think certainly Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, should be more aggressive about Ukraine funding right now. Full stop. No disagreement there. If you're looking at the arguments that they've made broadly about the importance of supporting Ukraine, I think that they've made better arguments than than Joe Biden has. And they 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 have um, made arguments that reflect, I think, the urgency of the situation in a way that Biden just hasn't. You know, I mean, you, you go back to the to the days before um, before Russia invaded and you had that Biden comment about, you know, the possibility of a minor incursion and sort of, you know, said our response will be dictated. I'm paraphrasing here, but our response will be yeah. will be dictated in part as to whether this is a minor incursion or not. I don't necessarily think that was the green light that some critics suggest it was. I think Russia was going to do what Russia was going to do. Right. But uh, it wasn't helpful. I mean, were and I you think expecting it, more than a minor incursion? I think like pretty yes. much everybody would. I don't think anybody was expecting. I mean, up until that moment, I was expecting Kiev to be like bombardment of Kiev. I, I, I yeah, I, I was expecting that. I was expecting not because I'm, I'm seeing around corners, but I was expecting sure. a, a, a fuller scale uh, invasion. I mean, I think they were doing what they were doing for a reason. But yes, you're right. I mean, yeah. you look at back and listen to the podcast from respected places like the Institute for the Study of War, and they were sure. not expecting a, a full scale invasion. I just think articulating it that way suggests the, the yeah. kind of um, ambivalence that Biden has had toward this project from the beginning. Like I said, I think he deserves credit for ending up on the right side of it. I mean, it's like Joe Biden on foreign policy in a lot, in a lot of different ways over the course of his career. He, he not, you know, I, I'm sort of not of the, is it, is it Robert Gates who said Joe Biden's been wrong about every single major foreign yeah. policy decision, you know, in his entire lifetime. I, I, I'm not as, I'm not as critical of, of Biden as that. I think he sometimes has ended up on the right side of foreign policy arguments, but he has this sort of meandering circuitous way of getting there. And in this case, I think it's been slow and I think it's been costly. I love the Gates. The people, the Gates quote gets thrown around by people that then end up supporting Trump and Gates has like been absolutely brutal <laughs> about Trump. And I got to take right. this kind of back to this, but I, but I, I want to just continue to pause before we get to the choice uh, element of this. Cause I, but I do think the Ukraine element is an important part of the choice. I guess you agree that the Ukraine issue, would you say putting aside the broad kind of democracy or authoritarianism, et cetera, you, uh, of the policy issues that might that we expect would face us in 2025. Would you say Ukraine is the most important to you? 
Yeah, I mean, you, I'd say Ukraine and related issues, Ukraine and, and yeah. NATO leadership and China and Taiwan. Right. I mean, just all the things that flow from decision making about Ukraine. No question. Um, OK, so the rest of the Biden editorial, I wanted to pick a couple of things. Uh, the rest of the Biden element. Well, actually, first. I, so how would you just grade Biden? I have a fun gimmick. You know, the Hugh Hewitt um, is Alger Hiss a spy gimmick. Um, here's my fun gimmick. I'd like to, for, if you wouldn't mind playing along with me on is I want you to grade and rank the last four presidents. So I, I'm going to let you think about this for a second. So if I'm Carrie Lake, probably grading Trump and a plus first Barack, a minus second, cause she voted for him. And then George Bush, like D minus and, and, and Biden F minus, like that would be her ranking. I'm curious yeah. what Steve Hayes ranking. And, 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 and just, just to presidents. clarify the, just to clarify the, the, the question, am I doing this yeah. based on the things that I believe as a limited yeah. government conservative? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just so, want you to grade like, yeah, what, what you would want out of a, an imagine, you know, you can imagine the imaginary president of Steve Hayes's dreams. I don't know who sure. that would be. John McCain sure. back from the grave, a plus. Uh, yeah. Nah. I don't, I don't, I also don't want to just on policy issues. But I know, you know, and policy is a big part of that, but also leadership and decision making, yeah, and et, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I would say um, I would give Biden a D. Um, I would give Trump an F. I would give Obama a D, maybe a D plus. Um, <laughs> and I would stuff out there in Steve Hayes world. I don't believe in great inflation, Tim. We yeah, I know. No great. See it all around us. I'm I'm the Harvey Mansfield of your gimmick. No great. <laughs> um, okay. And and I give and an F. Bush a B to B plus. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, what are so you grades? Grade, um, yeah, sure. I guess I'll give Biden like a B minus or a B. It kind of changes. Um, I would give uh, Barack Obama a C. George Bush like a C minus, and Trump an F. I mean, I love George Bush. I, like if you if we were just grading purely on a sheet of paper where you're like check marking policy issues, you know, and saying where do I have more check marks, I'm pr I would you know despite the fact that I've you know libbed up a little bit, um, I would still probably have the most check marks on George Bush's side. But like, I mean, the Iraq thing war is just an absolute disaster like in retrospect that uh, you know, again i don't I, we don't need to turn the whole pod podcast into an iraq war podcast but like the downstream negative effects of that i think are just so great that i just don't know how you can grade them better than anything beside a c minus so that's where i would that's where i'd land on um george bush and so i the gimmick i think is interesting because it's like okay well now now we've level set so you've got oh you've got Biden below Obama, maybe, or even tell, tell me why. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, um, look, I was not a fan of Barack Obama's presidency. I was pretty consistently critical uh, of Obama. I did a lot of reporting on some of the things that, that he did and said that I think were, uh, really bad for the country. Um, I think in part the, the concerns from, of a Biden, um, the greater concern about Biden over Obama is I, I really thought Obama was all there now for better and for worse. Right. I mean, I think he was making the decisions. I think he was driving the process. Um, I think he showed leadership most often, not leadership in the way that I would have liked, um, in a way that I don't, I don't think Joe Biden is, is executing the presidency. Um, I have real concerns about his mental acuity. I think that's a serious issue. I don't think it's a side issue. I think we've seen evidence of it. I think if you look at the way that Biden said he was going to to govern and the things that he wanted to do, unity is in my soul in his inaugural address, um, bringing the country together, whatever we want to say about the obstacles to that, and I think there have been, there were obstacles when he made the claims, there remain huge obstacles today. Uh, but I don't think he's governed that way. Um, either from a policy perspective or a, a rhetoric perspective. I'm glad you, you brought that up because that, that was one of the areas I wanted to push back on. I mean, I, look, I think based on expectations when he said that, I think the conventional wisdom everywhere, including on this podcast, was that um, Biden was naive about the, the obstacles and that he wouldn't be able to achieve the bipartisan efforts that he, that he said he was going to achieve. Biden thought that he could. There was a lot of criticism on the left of him for 
talking about wanting to work with Republicans and thinking that he could work with Republicans. And meanwhile, they passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill, CHIPS, a gay marriage bill, a guns bill, burn pits. They He has... He has a, the bipartisan coalition is really with them on NATO, like, right? I mean, on, on supporting our allies overseas, on supporting Ukraine, it's Republicans and Democrats, but you can say bipartisan, Biden hasn't been a leader in that, but it has happened. Uh, you know, he, in the meantime, has had Republicans, the, the entire Republican class saying that he's illegitimate, doing a fake impeachment dragging his son through the coals <laughs> and like he barely talks about them like he like he doesn't even talk about them that much uh so i don't know like to me man i, I feel like he has exceeded i would i would grade him above expectations clearly on the question of unity i mean yeah he can't wave a magic wand wow. and make our twitter wow. discourse change and change the change fox and msnbc and make them better but like for the things in his control, legislation, what he comes out of his mouth. What did you what did you think about his labeling anybody who disagreed with him, including Mitch McConnell and other Republicans uh, on the voting rights stuff as Jim Crow 2.0? I thought that was stupid. I thought that was I mean, that's pretty gross. That's pretty gross. That's that's really bad. I thought that was bad. And it's and it's consistent with what we've seen from Joe Biden over much of his career. Right. I mean, think about the, the, the things that he said when he was campaigning. He said, ah, if you're a black person, you're going to vote for Donald Trump, then you're not black or words to that effect. Um, he, you know, he has this off, off take, take off the chains comments um, going back earlier in his career. I think he's, I mean, I think he's Biden, Biden has been in the public eye for 50 years and you're bringing out three comments. I guess it's just like any of those things that you just said. Do you think you the things I'm citing middle, are, are unrepresentative? I do. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you put the by any Biden criticism that one might clutch their pearls about like in the middle of a Donald Trump speech, like it wouldn't even get tweeted about, like people wouldn't even mention it. Like it's totally, you know, it's to- just- totally different. Yeah. That's a totally different question, right? You, your question would, to me was not, how would you compare Joe Biden in these instances to that's Donald true. Trump? Your question was, do you think Joe Biden was a good president? And my point was, he said he was going to do these things. And not only in my view, hasn't he done them, notwithstanding your correct points about the fact of some bipartisan, policy accomplishments stipulated but ha- I mean, has he led in that fashion your expectations I don't on think that, that he had no no, no expectation that biden was going to do multiple bipartisan so bills, did i he? didn't think he was going to be um i didn't think he was going to be a good president um but i guess i maybe i was naive maybe i was was falling for the 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 idea that he because of sort of the grave crisis that the country is in um, and the things that he said in the aftermath of uh, all the election denialism we got from Trump and Trump's people from January 6th. I guess I thought that there was a chance that some of the things that Biden said in his inaugural, he really meant and and went beyond just making uh, arguments. And I don't think he's governed that way. I just don't. I mean, I think if you look look at but beyond beyond just the, the the Jim Crow 2.0 stuff and other comments like that, I mean, if you look back at the at the early spending proposals, um, he had Republicans, governors, and members of Congress who were willing to work with him on a bipartisan basis uh, to to restrain some of the spending in exchange for their support. Um, met with them at the White House. Um, I had one governor tell me a, a story about going to the White House, sitting down with Biden, Biden sort of agreeing with all of this sort of bipartisan consensus on spending. And yes, maybe the White House driven proposals are too much. We could rein some of it in here. We could come to a compromise. We could agree on something. Will you support it? And then you know, hearing Jen Psaki at the White House podium saying, in effect, the only the only direction this spending level is going is up. We're not talking about pulling things back and saying, geez, I thought Joe Biden might have, might have meant what he said there. And I don't think he did enough in those early days uh, in particular, as he was looking to, to set a tone. You know, I mean, we all the reason that we all talk about the first 100 days, the reason we all talk about the early parts of presidency is because it sets the tone for the entire four years. And it's usually when the most significant stuff gets done. And I don't think he did that. 
Uh, we are going to have a big. Uh, I'm saving a big agreement on spending for dessert. So I just want to stipulate that we concur <laughs> about spending, and I want to talk good. about that before I let you go. Um, I, but I do want to say though, again, and if you look at the bipartisan accomplishments that he's had, I, and you, know, you graded Obama better than him. Like Obama had basically none. Right? Uh, right. Trump had basically none. W had a couple in the fur at the beginning with no child left behind, but. I mean, we are a quarter of the way into the century. <laughs> like, Biden is basically the only president that has done anything on a bipartisan level. And you're like, well, not, a, not, not good enough for me. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I, I mean, just, what is our baseline? Yeah. I think you, I think you can go back and point to other bipartisan pieces of legislation that have passed under each of those presidencies. I think well, the question sure, is major how, how, how many, though. how many were, were driven by, the White House and this commitment to, to bipartisanship. I just don't see it. I really don't see it. I, and okay, I just have to lean on this one more time, though. Again, he comes in in the context. I hear that you gave one part of the context, right, which is that he promises to be a uniter. I get it. And so maybe in your view, he didn't do everything you wanted on that regard. But he also comes in where the, his predecessor doesn't show up to his inauguration. Sure. For the first for sure. time in history, where he's immediately under impeachment, where he has no like basically no rhetorical partners to work with on unity. Uh, you know, there, uh, there will be quiet partners on policy. And that's so that's what he did. Um, you know, there are Democrats that wanted him to antagonize the Republicans that wanted him to, uh, you know, do more unilaterally. And there's some complaints I have about what he did unilaterally. But I, I just again, I, I think that how do you you know, contextualize the choices that he made, given that he's in an environment where the other party is giving him no quarter and is smearing him, frankly, with lies over like that are unpre unprecedented. And some in his own party are like demanding that he be even more aggressive. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess part of the answer to that is I, I would look at the kinds of things he suggested he would do, which is resist the extremes on the right and on the left. And I'm not this is not a both sides comment, but like that's what he said he would do. And he, and he has I don't he think not he's, done that. I, don't think I mean, he's, he's resisted that. the no. left on uh, he's resisted the left on Gaza. He is not he's not tried to expand the Supreme Court. How has he, he resisted the left on states? Gaza? How has he resisted the mean? left on Gaza? In every way imaginable. I mean. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I mean, he, I mean he, has a, he has a huge base that is demanding that he that he, you know, basically abandon Israel. And like it was just yesterday, he's on the phone with Bibi saying, telling him once again that he's got his back. I mean, think about the rhetoric coming from from the left. Think about the rhetoric coming from Rashida, Rashida Tlaib wouldn't even well, stand for him I mean, at the State I of the would, Union. It was <laughs> it was Rashida Tlaib that wasn't standing for Biden at the State of the Union. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want to say that he's resisted the left because he has adopted Rashida Tlaib's position, conceded. I'm with you. I think what we've seen from him is sort of an early, unequivocal and uh, and strong embrace of Israel. And as the politics have proven more and more difficult, he's made concession after concession. He's, I think, made both sides comparisons that don't work. Um, he's he's. Uh, if you look at what's coming, certainly from leaks, sometimes in the names of his top officials, Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken, um, pointing out they're sort of advertising their differences with the way that Israel is uh, is conducting the war. Um, I don't think he's been uh, a strong ally of Israel in this instance. I think he has caved to the. To, to the left of his party. Okay. Well, we, uh, me and Jamie Weinstein went back and forth on Ezra. We can go list that one. I think he's been basically where he always is. I, I don't. I, I think the idea that a Democratic president would be even more aligned with Bibi, given Bibi's behavior um, and given the the action, the way that Bibi's conducted the war, I think that I, I, I think that he's been genuine to what you would expect a center left Democrat to do, given given the partner that he has in Israel, but. I mean, I don't know. Anyway. That, yeah, I don't know that he has to give a, a full throated rhetorical embrace of Bibi Netanyahu, the the person. Um, but you would agree that the things he's saying and doing now with these public warnings and leaks against Israel are at a very, very different place than the things he said after October 7th, where he said Israel's got sure, but to do everything he can to eliminate Hamas. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been five months, uh, though. And I, yeah, I, I hear you. I, I Look, I want to be able to eliminate Hamas, too. But I think there are a lot of factors here in the war, uh, going on. I think that you underplayed giving Joe Biden credit uh, with the leading from behind stuff when it comes to keeping NATO partners together. I think that a lot of our partners and other places around the world are even more hostile to Israel. And so I think that he's, he's him and Blinken are negotiating a pretty fragile balance. And yeah. um like, uh, let me let me concede a point. I, so I I think you're right. This none of this is easy. I mean I don't want I don't want to uh, give you the impression or give listeners the impression that I think this is easy and these are obvious answers and he made all sorts of bad choices right. and, uh, on easy answers. This is hard and I do think actually um, some of the restraint that's been frustrating to me with respect to Ukraine was necessary because he had to follow, in that case, some of our European partners. He couldn't have gotten out and been more aggressive um, than they were, particularly on some of the the oil issues, um, on on sort of the broader response. So in that case, I think restraint was probably wise. Um, It's it's not the case that I'm not making the case on on, um, either Ukraine or Israel that he's been a disaster. You just asked me based on where I come from, the way yeah. that I see this stuff, what I think. And I think he's he's not been great. It goes back to the curve. Um, uh, and But fundamentally, you would, uh, you, I mean, you obviously think that he would be preferable to Trump on both of those. Sure. Or maybe not on both, but yes. on the Ukraine issue. Um, uh, okay. I want to get back to the, I want to now get to the comparison. We get to the fun part now. All right. Now you get, now we got to choose. All right. I, I'm grading Biden on more of a curve than you are. You're, t- you're Harvey Mansfield. Uh, I appreciate that. Now we get to the question of what to do about the choice in front of us. And I'm, I'm a rhino, never Trump squish, as you know. Okay, so you've <laughs> always been more conservative than me. So instead, I, I kind of want to start this discussion and bring in a guest, somebody that you know and love, somebody that you wrote the book on even, Dick Cheney. Let's hear from Dick. In our nation's 246-year history, there has never been an individual who is a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. Liz is fearless. She never backs down from a fight. There is nothing more important she will ever do than lead the effort to make sure Donald Trump is never again near the Oval Office. And she will succeed. Oh, I'm putting on, you know, I'm putting on my helmet for the fight now. What do you say to Dick Cheney? Um, Greatest threat the country's ever faced. Most important thing that Liz will do is prevent him from getting in the White House again. What do you say to that to that statement? Yeah, I, I think he's right. I don't disagree with anything he said. Okay. And so <laughs> I was I was hoping for some pushback did you, there. I did didn't, you expect I didn't have my me to disagree? Right. Well, I guess I expect you to disagree because the editorial that you guys wrote assessed that that there that there is not, you know, that you shouldn't have to make a choice between these two candidates. And I think that the necessary conclusion of agreeing with Dick Cheney that Donald Trump is the greatest threat in our country's history and that preventing him from getting in the White House again is the most important thing that his daughter will ever do. I would think that given where we are now, March 20th, 2024, then the necessary next step is to say, okay, well, then I guess we got to get behind the guy I gave a D to. Yeah, so um, I'd encourage you to reread the editorial. Maybe you've read it more than once. Um, But I don't think that's what what the editorial uh, said. And let me just emphasize that um, this was a, a group effort, wasn't just me. And sure. in, in talking about it here, I'm speaking just for me. I'm not speaking for the institution. Sure. And let's um, just pause. I just let, let me just read an exact sentence so that we can talk about. Sure. It. Okay. Please. As we move toward the general election, the pressure from part the pressure from partisan cheerleaders. I guess that's me in this case, a very reluctant reluctant cheerleader. The pressure from partisan cheerleaders to line up behind one of these two unfit men will grow louder. And then you go on to say that yes. you're not going to bow to the pressure. It will. That you're not going to bow will. to the pressure to get behind one of these. You know, un- well, friends. so, yeah. So so what do we mean by that? Um, does it mean that we have to institutionally throw our support behind one candidate or the other? I don't think it does. And and I will say up front that the, we made a mistake in the editorial. I stand by everything in the editorial. The, the thing that the mistake that I made was not including a note in the editorial that we don't endorse candidates. We're never going to endorse candidates. It's been a policy since before we launched. It'll be a policy sure. as long as the dispatch exists. But having said that, I think it's a I think it's a 
I, I would challenge your read. Um, if, if your claim is that we're playing some moral equivalence or both sides game, go back and reread it. We're not, I mean, very, very clear. Let me, let me read you an exact sentence from, uh, from the editorial, which I think sounds a lot like what Dick Cheney said in the clip that you just played. We talked about uh, whether Trump would would win. If the election were held today, Trump would be projected to win relatively easily. That would be a disaster. Donald Trump is manifestly unfit for the presidency. Whether you also thought that was the case in 2016 or 2020 is immaterial. His conduct after losing four years ago and the campaign he has run, around, run this time around have rendered him a unique threat to the constitutional order. Couldn't put it more plainly than that. A unique, meaning yeah, unrivaled, but, uh, yeah, meaning right. that's meaning okay. not on the part sure. of Joe Biden. I, I'm not saying that you guys are saying that there's more equivalence. I'm saying that that where you come down is that we deserve better and they're they're both unfit. Maybe one's more unfit than the other or whatever. And you graded them one F, one D. But and I'm not asking you to endorse really, but you're you're cheesehead. Wisconsin's yeah. gonna be an important state. I know you probably got some pals, some cousins, some aunts, some uncles. Some of them probably call it, you know, your vote's in Maryland, so your vote doesn't really matter. Right. But um that call you and it's like, what do I do? These two unfit men, what do I do? I think that if I'm reading that editorial and I'm Steve's cousin in Waukesha, that I'm looking at this and saying, eh, okay, I can write in George Bush or whatever. Um yeah. uh, because these guys are both unfit. And to me, that's sending a signal that there is some kind of equivalence, right? That there isn't no, a way to judge. It doesn't, send, it doesn't send a signal that there's an equivalence. I think it's perfectly acceptable for people to write somebody in instead of casting a vote for Joe Biden. In Wisconsin? Trump. Sure. In Wisconsin? Sure. So, okay, so then how does that work? How can you agree with Dick Cheney's statement that Donald Trump is the greatest threat in the na- to the Democratic Republic in our history and also think when faced with a choice between that and a Democrat whose policy pr- choices I don't really agree with, the answer is neither. How, yeah, I don't I mean, understand how that works logically. Yeah, I, I, well, two, two separate questions. One is sort of the period between now and the actual election, and then one is, is on the voting. Um, I don't have any problem with people who say that they are going to withhold a vote for Donald Trump and that that's in effect their vote, or they're going to leave the presidential line open. They don't want to support Joe Biden for policy reasons for concerns about his mental acuity and his age, which I think are serious, serious concerns. Sure, I don't have any problem with anybody. Kamala Harris. Do you think that Kamala Harris is the greatest threat in the history of the Republic? I think she would be a disaster. I, I think she would be a disaster. I think she would be a horrible, horrible president. I mean, she's a worse sentient being. She can make an argument. You think she'd be worse um, than Donald Trump? I mean, look, she I went think, to the Munich Security Conference. She stands next to our allies. We go, like, she's not going to tear us out of NATO. She's not going to give Putin Eastern Europe. Like, she's not going to try to run for president again after she serves her out her time. She, no, there's no, going to be no mob storming the Capitol, waving Kamala Harris flags, attacking officers. I know this is yeah. a low bar, but this is the bar that we've had. I mean, the Republicans nominated him, so this is the bar that we've got. Like. I hear you that that's not exactly a glowing praise of Kamala Harris, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're probably right on most of that and maybe not all of it. I don't necessarily trust her convictions on, on Ukraine. I'm not sure we saw much in, in real foreign policy thinking from her during her campaign or her career that predated the campaign. Um, but sure. Yeah. You know, like I said, in the editorial and in my own voice, I think Donald Trump is a unique threat to, to the Republic. I don't think that that necessarily means that you as a voter have to cast a a vote in favor of Joe Biden. Um, If if, if I have relatives in Wisconsin who want to say I'm not I'm not I'm writing in, you know, you name it, I'm writing in Liz Cheney. I have no objection to that. I guess this is like there are these choices that happen in life all the time. You know, you're drunk at a bar. And you have to decide whether to drive home and risk a DUI or spend money on a cab you can't afford and then cab back early in the morning to pick up your car. You decide, well, I guess I'll do that. Like that seems better than risking my life. You know, my kids, like the local public school is terrible. I can't afford to go to private school, but I guess I'm going to pinch pinch pennies or work an extra job to send them to private school because I want like, like all this happens all the time. Like, you know, I get, 
I haven't had the luxury ever of voting for a president. I'm like, I really agree with them on everything. I mean, every president that I voted for before Hillary, who I disagree on lots of stuff, wanted to make my marriage illegal. But I was like, yeah, I figured on balance, I like what they think about foreign policy and other issues over this. And maybe that was a bad choice in retrospect. I don't know. But like, this is this is just how it is. I, like people throughout the country always, no matter what, face two choices where they're going to have fundamental disagreements about it. That's the fundamental nature of a two party. But they system. don't just face a two, two, two choices, right? I mean, quite literally, they face many choices. They could do something entirely different. Uh, not really, a, not. a number. I mean, Donald of, Trump or Joe Biden really? are going to be the president. Yeah, Donald Trump or Joe Biden are going to be the next sure, president. Sure, but but look at the one people. Of them dies. Look at the people who didn't vote for Trump in Wisconsin in 2020. Um, more people left that line blank, if I recall, than uh, was the difference between the Biden Trump uh, margin. Didn't they make a statement? Double check yeah, me on I, that. Again, I guess I mean, I'm isn't not that judging, yeah, no, that is true. That is true. That is true. And I don't, by the way. Like I am, I'm speaking to like I am more interested in in how like the responsibility and the thoughts of somebody that is a public figure, a commentator, an influencer. I, look, if there's a, if a regular person in in Wisconsin that has passionate views about abortion and and life issues that are so great that they just could never vote for somebody that wants to support abortion, I I respect that. I disagree with that judgment, but like. You know, what I'm objecting to is this notion that you can look at these two men and that you can assess like, and that you can be clear eyed about the threat that Donald Trump faces and then that you can say, mm, I don't know. But I, who's I saying, think, I, think I don't know. A, I think you're just a, I think that's you're just talking about houses for me. No, no. This is exactly the, the, the point of the editorial. You're 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 judging this through the prism only of a vote. Right. And. The, the editorial very no, clearly an argument says for who you think is better an argument the, the editorial does not say we judge joe biden to be manifestly disastrous but also clearly better than donald trump you no, could do we that. think joe you biden we think joe biden was a crummy is a crummy president do and we're happy to say the greatest risk me, to the democracy me, in the history of the country no well that's why we called donald trump okay. a unique risk to, risk i mean okay. we said so it very plainly so he's less of a risk you do we agree say he's it. less of a risk I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's, we say it like literally it's, that's written. It's, it's what I just read you from the editorial. Yeah. We say it. It's that's, that's sort of one of the points, but let me ask you this from, from the perspective, sure. I mean, you just called yourself sort of a, a, a partisan or a reluctant partisan, a huge part of what's gotten us into this trouble is sort of knee jerk partisanship, the kind of unthinking support for one candidate or another, one party or another, uh, from people across the political spectrum, that forces this, you call it a, a, a binary choice, um, that forces these awful choices on the voters. And I think leads to a pretty significant and, and problematic distortion in the political debate when you're arguing enthusiastically, if, if we were to argue, if the dispatch, if I were to argue enthusiastically on the part of in favor of Joe Biden when I'm not enthusiastic about his candidacy. Doesn't that have really distorting yeah. effects on the debate and the way that we operate? Yeah, I get. Um, yes, but I just don't assess that that is what has happened on the Democratic side compared to the Republican side. I and mean, I think you see that happening on both sides, but I don't think so. I think Joe Biden right now, there's a lot of people on his progressive left speaking out to criticize him. I think of the bulwark, you know, we range from people like JVL who want to put him on Mount Rushmore to people that think he's been a pretty bad president. And uh, we have multiple people who have called for him to step aside at the bulwark. And I, I, uh, we didn't get into this, but uh, I, I wrote down a little note of my list of things that I've disagreed with him on and spoken out abortion, spending, Afghanistan. Uh, so I, I don't think that there, I think that people have been clear, pretty clear eyed about Joe Biden. I don't, you very rarely see. Uh, with the exception of maybe the age issue would be the one area where I would say there's an exception. Yeah. People like going on TV to defend Joe Biden and like making uh, gobsmackingly false bullshit, bad faith defenses of him, which you see all the They're time. Everywhere. Anytime a Republican does any interview. I mean, did you listen to the Dan Crenshaw interview on your own podcast? I mean, it's like 
you know, the kind of strain strain that people have to come to def- to come to J- D- Donald Trump's defense is is like is absurd. I, I just I, like I don't feel that. I think that a lot of people are pretty honest about the fact that like they thought Joe Biden was the best option in the Democratic primary. Now that they've got him, and now they think he's the best option of these. There's no cult of Joe Biden out there. You don't think just answer, answer this question. You okay. don't think that people are. In, in, in sort of partisan fervor, people are polishing Joe Biden as, uh, as a president, as a candidate. I mean, I, I just have a hard time. I, I don't understand how somebody who's a conservative can look at what's happened over the past three and a half years and think, yes, this is great for the country with respect to Biden's presidency. I don't, I don't get it. And look, maybe on what, maybe, like on like what in particular? Like well, in, all in of what, the things that I, so all of the things that we discussed at the beginning of the, of yeah, I, the, the yeah, podcast. I, do guess, I, mean, I, guess I don't see how you're curve. a limited government think... conservative and you say, boy, I look at Joe Biden. I think he's been a terrific president. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, well, it may sure. be the case that, answer, that some of these people that. are no longer conservative. He's followed the rule Fair of enough. law. He's, I mean, he's followed the rule of law. You know, uh, he's he stood with our allies, but he's that like that makes him a good truthful. The economy is getting better. The crime rate is getting better. I don't like I, I, are there many policy issues where I would look at Joe Biden and say, sure, I disagree with that. Like, absolutely. Like, do I wish we and, and this would be a nice transition. Do I wish we'd cut spending? Like, sure. But like, I, I, again, is that are those disagreements more fundamental than the ones that I had with George Bush? But that's a different no, question. They're that's not. a different question. That's a different question. The question I'm asking is in in as you face the next six, eight months, yeah. are you and I'm I'm not talking as much about um, Democrats here as as much as I am about fellow conservatives, in, including maybe especially Trump skeptical conservatives. Are we going to enter a period and my my I'll, I'll give away my answer. My answer is yes, yes, we are entering such a period. And that's a big part of why we decided to write this editorial where you're going to get from people who f- agree with you and me on the threat that, that Trump is, a distorted, partisan, um, turd-polishing assessment of Joe Biden's presidency in a way that I think is fundamentally dishonest. That's a problem to me. And I think we're about to – I think we've had a, a, a bad debate around – the presidential election for the past, let's say, six months. And I think it's about to get dramatically worse because you're going to have people saying stuff they don't believe to to make Joe Biden appear more acceptable to Nikki Haley voters, to reluctant Trump voters. They're going to say a bunch of stuff about how great Biden is that they fundamentally don't believe. And that I think is inconsistent with limited government conservatism. Yeah, I actually just disagree with that. Frankly, I I think this is why kind of the frustration I had with you as editorial. I think that the best thing you could say about Joe Biden right now is that I think he's been a bad president, but uh, he's obviously better than somebody that isn't f- a fundamental risk to the country. Like, sure. I think that's the most helpful thing that somebody could say about Joe Biden. I actually don't believe that. I feel like I've I don't think anybody that listens to this podcast so far would be like you've been really turd polishing Biden. I have some there's some merits. There's some demerits. I wish he was younger. I wish he spent less. I, the Afghanistan thing was a disaster. But like all in all, over the scope of how I measure him against other presidents of my adult life, I, I, I think marginally, marginally better is kind of how I measure it. I, I, I don't think that that's then I polishing. Think, and I think great, the people that, that are more critical of him that, that's, that say what's well, good. I mean, look, you had another I, sh- I should have mentioned this at the top, but that uh, Ala Pundit at the or Nick Cattagio, we're calling him now is uh, at the dispatch road kind of a pushback. Um, slight pushback to the editorial, which I really recommend that people read. And and he said, look, if conservatism, broadly speaking, is a belief in ordered liberty, secured by the rule of law and limited government power, those who support Trump because some of his policies will be better than Biden are signing conservatism's death warrant. And so I, I, I guess I would say from a conservative perspective, like I think from a democratic perspective, Trump is a disaster. But like having Trump be the president is the end of classical liberal conservatism, however you want to call but it. It's like the end of it in this country. But Nick is pushing back there on on conservatives who support Trump. So he's not talking to me. He's not talking to people in the editorial. 
But no, but I'm I'm using that point to push back on your question is how can you from a conservative standpoint like look at Joe Biden? And I'm saying, well, look, no, I'm looking at the choice. And and a Donald Trump victory is the end of the type. I don't of have any problem profile, with people who who I, I don't have any problem with people like Nick. And I I agree. I commend that that piece. We think it's consistent with the editorial. We think it it was responding to the editorial, but perfectly rational argument to make. He's an individual. He's endorsed Joe Biden. Fair enough. We're happy to have people on our staff do whatever they want in their individual capacity. The, 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 the point I'm making is we are going to have, um, and we're already seeing it. We are going to have people, I think largely in, in order to persuade gettable center-right disaffected Republicans, never Trumpers, what have you, um, to vote for Biden who are not telling the truth about Joe Biden. And I think if, if you're doing what you say you're doing, which is, Hey, I'm, I'm pointing out Biden's flaws. I'm criticizing where I need to. And I still think he's better than Trump. Fair enough. I and mean, that's where I end up. But there aren't, there are a lot of people who aren't doing that. I mean, look at, there's a, there's sure. Joe, Joe I mean, Scarborough. The entire enterprise is a lie though. I know that I feel like sometimes, sometimes it's like, okay, we're going to nitpick the democratic, you know, the areas where some Democrats are gilding the lily a little bit. And then meanwhile, like literally the entire Trump campaign is premised on a lie. Of course I, it the, is. I, I, we're not, yeah, I, but, the, whole, the whole thing just by saying any word in support of Donald Trump. I, is, but who's, but, but, but I, I, I'm doing that. But I'm criticizing Donald Trump. We, we're we're pretty critical well, of Donald Trump. People, at the, dispatch. the people that I'm talking about, you're you're right now focusing on the people that are spinning for Joe Biden. But like the people that are spinning for Joe Biden are, are doing so on the margins compared to the type of spin that you see in support of Donald Trump. I just Again, I mean, totally, I, I just you don't, don't believe think... your lying eyes kind of shit. Like we're in the upside down world. No, I, I think it's entirely appropriate to to do that. You call it gilding the lily. I say it's just not honest. Like I think people who are you know more more or less broadly in our business, if you see something that you think is notable, if you believe something, you should just say it. We led the editorial off with a quote from Charles Krauthammer to say the, the 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 job is to be honest and to speak the truth and to do it bluntly. Yeah. I, that was the whole point of what we did. I think there are people who aren't doing that. And I'll give you an example. Joe Scarborough on Morning Joe last week went on this rant, right? Pro this, this incredibly pro Biden rant. Joe Barton, Joe Scarborough, who at one time was a conservative representative from the panhandle of Florida. Um, yeah. Obviously he's, he's been on something of a journey, but he said, F you if you can't handle the truth. This version of Biden intellectually, analytically, is the best Biden ever. Now, I would just say that's patently untrue. It's untrue on its face. Very few people in the world could actually believe that if you pay attention to Joe Biden on a day to day basis. And I think one of the things that we were warning about is, is this kind of bullshit. Like, we shouldn't do that. It's bad. That's it fair. distorts guess, the debate. I I, it's not totally it's not true. Totally agree. I, uh, my final question on this, then I want to get to the last two things. We're over time already. Did um, is there a single person besides Mitt Romney in elected Republican office right now that you feel like speaks the truth about the state of the party and the country and the leader of the party? Elected Republican. No, I mean Republican? you mentioned Brian Kemp earlier, and I think he's Brian Kemp. He, yeah, and, yeah, he's okay. close. No, and by I the, think Romney. By the way, by the way, just I'm glad you mentioned Brian Kemp because I was going to say this earlier and then we got on a tangent. Again, like I would I would totally hear your criticism of people that are like, oh, I think that you should vote for Stacey Abrams over Brian Kemp now because the threat to the republic is so great. Right. Like that's not right. You know what I mean? I think that's a different category. But like that's not that's not the situation here with Donald Trump. Anyway, um, Kemp, okay. Even though he said he's voting for Trump, but Matt, any anybody else that you think is speaking truth truthfully? On a consistent basis among currently elected Republicans? No, not really. It's pretty dark. Um, okay, yeah. It's pretty I, dark. Uh, another, okay, we have one agreement now into our next agreement. I have to do this, and then you get to ask me a question, then I'm going to let you go. Um, spending. Uh, I, this is why I have to do this, because I do not want us to be outflanked. And Matt Iglesias, that progressive liberal over <laughs> in Slow Boring, wrote an article this week that I was like, yes, uh, talking about how this is a time for austerity. Uh, we're at 34 trillion in debt. I actually had to Google that. I thought it was 32. And then when I Googled, I realized, well, I thought it was 32 because it was 32 like six months ago. Approaching 35. Um, yeah. yeah uh, 
the Biden plan um, for it uh, is very modest uh, spending flattening uh, and tax hikes that would get blocked by the inevitable GOP Senate. Uh, the Trump plan is a debt explosion. I mean, <laughs> this is this is where I feel the most like I'm in the remnant with you guys. Like, what the fuck, Steve? Like, what? Like, is what? Is there any like? Are there any green shoots on this? Like, do you see any? Anything, anything in the future? I mean, we have with interest rates this high. This is absolutely the worst possible time to be running these deficits with high interest rates and low unemployment. And yet there's literally nobody in either party, really, besides, I yeah. guess, Tom Massey. That's like, we should do something about this. Yeah. Um, no, it's incredibly depressing. Um, I don't think Biden has been good on these issues. And I don't buy his the White House argument, which has been fact checked 50 ways to to Sunday, um, that he's reducing the deficit. It just doesn't add up. Uh, if you look at the, the analyses from Brian Riedel at the Manhattan Institute, who is intellectually honest, um, certainly not carrying water for Donald Trump, um, he has sort of shredded those arguments, as have people like Glenn Kessler and other um, fact checkers who, again, are not carrying water for Donald Trump. No, I'm, I mean, it's it one of the most depressing moments of recent political memory was that was that moment at the in last year's State of the Union when Biden sort of made the accusation that uh, Republicans were all for cutting cut spending. And cut they're spending, like, no, we're not. Cut entitlements. And then the Republicans in uni unison <laughs> object to this howl and say, no, we don't want to. We don't want to. Biden concludes that by saying, boy, it's great that we have consensus on this. You know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that sort of. Now, that hasn't kept Biden, I should point out, from demagoguing the hell out of this on these entitlement questions. I mean, his White House continues to put out claims that Republicans are actively looking to cut entitlements, to throw granny off the cliff, things like that. I think it's dishonest. I think it's just fundamentally dishonest. But no, I mean, you know, the the the, the line I've, I've used before is nobody seems to care about debt and deficits right now. And there's going to come a point, and I'm afraid it's coming very soon, where everybody's going to care. Because there's going to be sort of a catastrophic result of shedding responsibility on this and putting these things off for subsequent generations to to solve. And the the numbers, you know, we're now at this point where the things, the predictions that people were making 10, 15 years ago about interest on the interest on the debt is going to surpass, you know, defense spending or what, you know, fill in your blank spending. We're now there. And some of the projections for the insolvency of, of Social Security and other things, you know, those used to be 30, 40, 50 year timelines. We're now talking about like 10 years. Like somebody's going to have to step up and solve this problem. Um, neither party is doing a very good job. We're going to have this clip when that moment comes to, to rub in people's faces. <laughs> and uh, for the liberal listeners, I would go read Matt's case on this. I mean, Matt, I've, unlike Steve, I think maybe they'd have a disagreement on the tax portion of this. I, as I've uh, as I've been on not quite the full Joe Scarborough journey, but as I've been on my journey, I, you know, Steve, I've met a lot of rich people out there lately and I'm kind of OK. We can some of them can afford to pay a little bit more. I'm not going to get my panties in a wad about 400 K thousand dollars a year, folks getting a little tax hike. Um but I would like to see it paired with some some spending cuts on this. And I think folks should listen to Iglesias. Okay, we're over time, but I promise you. So you, you cannot do this if you don't want. But you do get one opportunity to take a whack at me. And so if you can take it or pass. So l let me just, I guess, let me ask a, a big question, then maybe I'll, I'll narrow if we can go quickly on it. Um, yeah, we can go. What's What do you see as the path out of this? Like, what would you have... Um, you know, non-Trumpy Republicans do sort of broadly. You've been you had a yeah. you had an item where you were pretty skeptical of of Republican donors funding normie candidates who are losing. Um, you know, yeah. you're you're skeptical of people voting third party. What what's the right thing in your view of sort of non-Trumpy Republicans up and down the income? ladder to do here. Yeah, it's a good question. And we can do follow up on the donors. I'll say one sentence. The, the big Republican donors have had the longest losing streak of anybody in history. And if any any rich person in any other parts of their lives, any other parts of investments, they would never spend this money at throwing good money after bad. And I just I wish they would give money to, to you know, under underprivileged kids or something instead of to Republican consultants who keep coming up with the same ideas. And that's my problem, really, is like, okay, if you want to engage in Republican primary fights, that's fine. But 
doing the same shit that hasn't worked for 10 years and thinking you're going to get a new result is driving but if crazy. they're but if they're um, taking on trump well, why would you have them not they're not given though. the arguments they're you not. made i mean some of them are no i mean not not really i mean these ads like come on like i always say it's like it, it's like rc cola running against coca-cola and it's like oh I, we think we're gonna overthrow coca-cola by doing an ad that's like Ooh, well we think there's a little bit too much high fructose corn syrup in there i like it's just like they got to either come for trump's head I, you know if they, if somebody had said to me okay man hey i got a hundred million and i'm gonna spend between 2020 and 2024 to seed the ground on Fox and with Newsmax about how Trump failed. He failed to build the wall. He failed. He lost the, the, you know, the courts told him he was wrong, embarrass him, make him seem fat and stupid. I'd been like, hell yeah. Okay. Maybe that wouldn't have worked. I don't know. Maybe that wouldn't have worked, but it would have been a try. It wouldn't have been like a virtue signal, $1 million soup and ad campaign that we've tried a million times. It isn't going to work. At least that would have been an effort. Um, How about an effort to pressure 10 more Republican senators to have voted to convict him? That would have been a good use of rich people money saying that like, OK, hey, I'll give you I'll, I'll put in a $10 million super PAC. I, this is maybe a bribe. So you can't do it exactly like this. But you could signal to Republicans that yeah. you would defend. No, and I think that's good. Them if they, that's a good. That would have been good. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that there are a million things that you could try. And I, I just I would like them to try to try rather than to give the same consultants more money for their beach houses to run limp ads against Donald <laughs> Trump while Donald Trump tears their face us off. Like Donald Trump is out there like Ron De Sanctimonious is a short man who can't even reach the toilet and he's an idiot and he's a loser. And then it's like, we're going to have a super PAC guy that's like, Mr. Trump is a little me. Like, it's like, what? They would never, these consultants would never do this in any other case. They would, in no other campaign would they be like, I'm going to let my guy get his face ripped off and I'm going to do patty cake back. But that's what they've decided to do with Trump because they're like, because they think that any harsh criticism of Trump fails. And maybe that's right. But I, I, I guess I would have liked to have seen them try. And I would like to see some creative thinking with all that, with all that resource. I mean, but what do you so make of the, what do you make that? of the effort that was, that was poured into, into Iowa early by um, AFP and others spending a lot of money testing lots of, ads that were pretty critical of Trump, I think weren't yeah. just sort of tiptoeing around the Trump problem yeah. that just proved ineffective. I guess my, I, I read that item that, that you wrote and my reaction was what would, what would Tim have them do? I I'm sort of like, yeah, it failed. Like it didn't work. Obviously look where we are, but I'm glad that there are people who are still willing to like make the argument and put up the money. Um, even, yeah, even if sure. it ends up not working. I mean, I think I you like have a different perspective because you come from, poli- you know, political consulting and you, you know, sort of the, yeah. the, the world of politics in a way that I just don't. So maybe that informs your view and your. Yeah, your I like some of the testimonial that. ads. Yeah, I like some of the testimonial ads. I guess I just want different ideas. I, I, I'm not maybe this is wrong, but I'd love to see some, a rich conservative person try this uh, rather than run a patty cake Republican up against a MAGA Republican in a red district. Why not run Steve Hayes as a Democrat in a red district and and not actually or as an independent of the Evan McMullen thing? The Evan McMullen thing didn't quite work in Utah, but I think that was mostly about Evan and Mike Lee. I think that that model could, in theory, work in different places where there was a stronger conservative as the independent candidate and a weaker MAGA as the Republican candidate. I would like to see that tried. I guess I would just like to see something tried. I, the the AFP creative. ads I thought were fine with the testimonial ads. But man, I don't, a lot of this stuff was way too little, way too late. We learned from 2016. I didn't feel like anything, but he learned anything. Nobody called me. Nobody was like, what did you learn from the our principles pack thing in 2016? To me, I saw a lot of people doing the same shit we did. So that drove me crazy. And then lastly, this is maybe too much to ask, but rather than spending $5 million, like once your efforts failed... I wouldn't mind some of them. And this goes back to our other discussion saying, hey, you know what? Joe Biden's actually better this time, but but I'll, we'll table that. What do I think that regular people, should, Republican folks should do? I, I've got bad news, Steve. I, I think that once Donald Trump was nominated one time, the, the water was contaminated. Once he was nominated twice, it was another contamination. And then they nominated him a third time. And I just, I think the pool is, the Republican Party pool is contaminated permanently, or like at least for a generation. And I think the idea of thinking that you're going to win with inside the party, like I'm being, you know, you could tell me that the right thing to do is have people who secretly are good, but have them run as crazy people. Maybe that's your answer. Okay. I guess is it better to have secretly good people? I don't really think so. But, um, 
you know, I, I just I, I don't think it is. I, I think that the Democratic primary electorate has shown itself to be much more practical in a lot of places, not everywhere. I think that there's a realignment happening. I think that the best case scenario for our realignment right now is that we have kind of an internationalist, capitalist, center left party, a Boris Johnson-y populist right party. And and then we have some Steve Hayes people and some um, Rashida Tlaib people who are homeless. <laughs> like I think that's like the best case scenario for us. And I like I look at those options and I see a clear preference for me. Uh, maybe not everybody would see a clear preference for them in that. Um, but I, I, you know, that's basically what I would what I would tell folks. I would tell folks to run for local offices. Um, but I also would tell people to be clear eyed about the party. And I think that we spent a lot of time with people who aren't very clear eyed about the party, making choices based on their false premises about where the party actually is. And, um, and like my final point is that to those donors and to these politicians is to anybody who's looking for my advice about what to do, I would say, go to a Trump rally, go to a turning point USA event, go to hang out with real MAGA Republicans sit in one of Sarah's focus groups and then come out of that. And then whatever your strategy is, have it based on what is really happening out there. And that is, I think, a frustration that I have with people on the normie right. And and I, I'll, I, obviously, this is your podcast. You have the last word. But just a point on that. No, please. I think that part of the reason I, I don't agree with what sounds like a more fatalistic approach to all of this than I have is I it's in, implied in in the end of your answer which is there are so many sort of I don't even you know if you'd call them rank and file Republicans but let's call them rank and file Republicans who are not they're not MAGA heads right so like there's this right. unbelievable activist massive activist Republican base that's just Trumpy and we can call them part of the cult whatever they're Sure. They're gone. There's there's probably no reasoning with them. They're they're not gettable. They're not persuadable. But what do you do with the the chunk? And, and I would say, I don't give a shit about the Republican Party. I don't care about the Republican Party. Not a Republican myself. What do you do with voters who are out in the country who aren't paying attention to every single twist and turn of what's happening here? Who don't know what's happening at the Trump rallies. And we can criticize yeah. them for that, fault them for that. They should be sure, better, sure, fair, better citizens. What do you do with them? Are you sort of write them off as like part of the no. the, the GOP problem? I don't or write them off. Are they gettable? Do you reachable? Do you ever talk to them? Do you make arguments to them? Yeah, I don't write them off. I think that they're like, look, I think that it's funny. Our people are like in the wilderness. It's been a flip. The question is, what would you have said to the populist right people for all this time, right? They were pro voters. Sometimes they didn't vote. Sometimes they voted for pro. Sometimes they voted for the Republican in the primary. Maybe they thought Bill Clinton might be good for two minutes and then he wasn't, right? Like, I think that's these people now. Like, I would look at them and say, that's you. You know, in Georgia, you had kind of two pretty good options. Neither of them you probably agreed with 100%. Brian Kemp might be too socially conservative for this imaginary person in the Atlanta suburbs. Raphael Warnock is probably too fiscally liberal. But they were two decent options, and you can go out there and vote for them and feel good about your vote. And they're the they're the best options available. They're not perfect, and I think that's kind of your life for a generation. And may and maybe the tectonic plates will shift, and and you should organize. And if you find a really good Democrat you like, like Jake Auchincloss, or you find a really good Republican you like, like Brad Raffensperger, you should go organize. You should go get involved and give them money. And that is, I think, um, would be my advice. And with that. We've gone so far over. I'm running into my next podcast. Stephen Hayes, I wanted to give you the last word. Do you have a final word? Why don't you do? You should get the last word because you came You came here. We had a really honest debate. I there survived. There some people in the comments that are unhappy with you. So don't read the comments from the people that are unhappy with you. I want to have these conversations and I appreciate you for coming. So if you have a final word, take it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think much about people who are unhappy with me. A lot of people have been unhappy with me for the last decade. Um, no, I appreciate it. I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy doing this. Uh, I think it's fun. We will, we'd love to, to have you, uh, do a home and home. Uh, so we'll, we'll bring you over as things get deeper and deeper, uh, into this election year and, and we'll do it again. Thanks for having me. I'd be honored to do a home and home. Thank you, Steve Hayes. Uh, that's the Bulwark podcast for Wednesday. We'll see y'all back here tomorrow. Peace.